when we talk about marked moments, there are moments that God marks you. And everyone in here, you've had moments when God's marked you in your life. Even if you're not saved, God marks you and you're constantly convicted because he keeps calling for you, calling for you, and you're running from him or you're backslidden, whatever it may be, and he's calling for you. He's marked a moment. If that's the only one you ever get, it's more than enough. And when I think about these marked moments, I mean, I, I, I've had many, but I can think of a handful. I mean, I can just tell you 50, 20 at least, just concerning where you're sitting today and how God brought all this to pass. That were just marked moments where God woke me up, God gave me a word, God had me step out. And thank God there's people in this church that's crazy enough to go with me, amen? And then there, I can just talk about marked moments where God's given me revelation about healing and signs and wonders, about salvation, about all those things. But the uncommon anointing is so unique in the vision God gave us this year because we all have an anointing as a child of God, right? Holy Spirit's living in you. And he's anointed you, and, and, and it's up to you to get yourself equipped, but he's anointed you for cert certain gifts, talents, abilities, purposes. <clears throat> he's anointed you to be blessed and prosperous and healed and free and full of joy. But an uncommon anointing is when it goes beyond the anointing that was just generally assigned to you in this life, or it goes beyond the anointing that you have understanding or revelation of. So what is revelation? It's the revealed word of God. It's like, you know, the scripture where it says, well, how do, I, how do I grow my faith? You know, how do I grow my faith? By hearing and by hearing the word of God. You see, we grow by hearing and hearing the word of God. Most people just stop at hearing and they think it, it's just duplicating itself. If it's duplicating itself, it wouldn't have another conjunction. It just had a comma but it has a conjunction called and, which means to add to or also. So the way I grow faith, increase faith in my life is by hearing and hearing the word of God. By hearing and hearing. The first hearing is when you've been exposed to it and you heard it. You read it and you heard it. But the hearing that is the most important is when you hear it revealed as God meant it to be for you. Hearing, faith comes how? By hearing and hearing the word of God. What does that mean? So whenever I hear it, it gives me an opportunity to study, to understand, or sometimes I don't even have to. It just drops in my spirit from God. What is it? It's revealed. It's revelation. It's revealed to me. Like when I was praying for this wonderful couple over here and I saw her under also several things, but a, a physical attack, and I quoted 1 Peter 2.24. By his stripes you were healed, the second half of that verse. By his stripes you were healed. Not could be, should be, would be. Well, I got a revelation of that, and it just rocked me. That no matter if my body, the fact is that my body is battling a sickness, but the truth is, by his stripes I am healed. No matter what kind of financial pressure you have, and maybe you're dealing with lack or not enough or poverty or bankruptcy, I don't know, or maybe you're just stressed trying to hang on to what you have. You know, my God, the scripture God gave me a revelation of was that God said, I will make you rich. A lot of people are rich that are not happy. They're addicted, they're broken. I will make you rich with no sorrow. So rich is not just money. Rich is health and relationships and, all, and having the money you need and all that. But if you're working yourself to death and you're just pushing and pressing to the point you're sorrowful over it, even though everybody else is enjoying the fruits of your labor, you're not living in the blessing and the revelation God has for you. And we all struggle with that off and on, right? I could talk about money and hit 80% of the people in here minimum. I talk about physical and it hit 100% of the people. Because everybody's battling with something in our body. It could be a little this or a little that. But whenever we get, have a moment, a divine moment or a marked moment with a divine encounter of God, whenever God visits us through a visitation, it can be a vision, a dream, a revelation. It can be drop in my spirit. 
You see, the nine gifts of the Spirit, uh, 1 Corinthians talks about it. It says that these gifts are what? Given by the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But what do they do? They are to what? Strengthen you, enable you, equip you. How? Through what? Through word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning the spirits. That's the revelation gifts. That's not talking about your knowledge. It's talking about God's knowledge. It's something that God knows that you don't know. It's just like sometimes I'll be ministering to someone and God will show me a, an illness or a doctor appointment or their name. I don't know that. It's not in the Bible, but God reveals it in my spirit, right? Or maybe I shouldn't go here and I should go there, and, and then I find out later why. Why? Because God reveals it in my spirit, and I have a revelation of hearing his voice, but I'm always wanting to grow that. But whenever you hear a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom is not just being intelligent. A word of wisdom is when God gives you his wisdom on a matter and also when God gives you wisdom about something you got to deal with in the future. When he gives you a word of knowledge, it's something he wants you to know now to help you now and maybe from something in the past. But when he gives you wisdom, that means what? He's giving you wisdom is knowledge plus experience and maturity <laughs> equals wisdom, basically, right? Is this okay? Yes. Discerning the spirits the Bible talks about, it's like whenever uh, Jesus called for Nathaniel and they brought him to him, and before he got to him, Jesus spoke to him, and he said, ah, Nathaniel, a man with a good heart or a good spirit, a good heart. And he said, well, sir, how do you, know, first of all, my name, then how do you know what kind of heart I had? And God, and Jesus just began to reveal to him, oh, I saw you sitting under, I forget the name of the tree, over here in this other area of Bethany or somewhere, I saw you sitting under a tree. And when I saw you sitting under a tree, my father revealed your heart to you. And he says, not only do you have a great heart with man, but you also have a great heart. And I tell you, you will see angels come and go and you will see the supernatural. You will see, it's really cool. I'm just paraphrasing. What does it mean? Discerning the spirit. Some people think they have discerning the spirit's gift and all they do is look for the negative. Oh, they're just dumb or they're not smart or oh, they're this or they're that. Looking for the negative. Oh, God revealed to me they're an angry person. Well, you're probably the angry person because it doesn't take a gift to find flaws in people. It just takes a lot of pride because you probably got way more flaws than they do. And the more you put them down, the better you feel about yourself. But when you're starting close to the floor, there's not much help for you <laughs> unless you repent and get a revelation that only God can give you the humility. God can give you the wisdom. God can give you the strength. You can do a lot in your own natural abilities and stuff. But favor has nothing to do with luck. And discerning the spirits, I, I, you can operate in discerning of someone's need, someone's uh, sickness, someone needs provision, someone battling anxiety, whatever it is, or discern that, wow, I need to spend a little time with that person. They're getting ready to face something. I don't know what it is, but I need to pour into it, right? Or someone comes in your life, you go, oh, okay, yeah, they sound like good, but I'll just kind of be nice to them and just stay away from them or I got to test them. You're discerning their human nature or spirit because John, and the Bible says in uh, John's gospel, first John is, John, we're, yeah, John's gospel where uh, Paul said, I pray for your W-H-O-L-E, your whole spirit, soul, and body that it be found blameless in that day. What? The day you're with the Lord. So you're not a dual, you're a tri. You are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. Your soul is your mind when your emotions. Now, when we look at divine moments, marked moments, which are divine, theos, the word divine is theos, means Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Whenever we have these marked moments with divine encounters, so you can have encounters of all kinds, right? You all watch horror movies and stuff, you, know, you get an encounter, right? That's why you're afraid to drive by yourself at night. But anyway, that's another story. <clears throat> That's why you don't name your kids Freddy, right? If you're Freddy, I'm sorry. You know, Freddy Krueger. <laughs> Just kidding. Sorry, Freddy's. But whenever we begin to look at it and we have these marked moments with God, you can't ever forget them. 
There's certain scriptures I can go to and I don't ever. They're just branded in my heart. You know, like I tell you, greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. I say that three times a month at least in services. Why? Because it's a revelation that I, I live by that whenever I feel I can't do it, I know God's got a way. I just got to seek him till I find his way. Because what's happening in me is greater than what's happening to me or around me. And I love the scripture where it says, no weapon formed against me can prosper. Sometimes people don't even realize they're a weapon in your life, but God's not going to let them prosper if you have revelation that they can't prosper. They might succeed for a little while, but they're not going to prosper in it. It will end. I said it will end, right? Um, so as we begin to understand scriptural revelations, things that mark you like, you know, Acts 2, all the great scriptures of baptism, the Holy Spirit, and all that. Whenever we begin to look at, I didn't cover the other six gifts of the Spirit. Sorry, they're not our gifts. They're His gifts, right? Healings, miracles, signs and wonders, gift of faith, those three. Gift of faith is not your faith or the faith that's been imparted to you. It's when God gives you His faith on a matter. It's finished. If you have revelation and can discern it. Any miracle sign of wonder takes at least three gifts to operate, sometimes five. You got to have a discerning heart to know what God's saying, right? You got to discern. You got, then you need a word of knowledge or wisdom on what happened and how you can help it. And then you got to got to operate in one or maybe two or three of the miracle gifts, whether it's healings, get to faith, uh, healings, get to faith, miracles, miraculous, signs and wonders. Gift of faith is passive because it doesn't depend on you. God's is but using you as a vessel. It's passive. Miracles, it says working of miracles, like Samson taking the jawbone of the ass and killing a thousand Philist Phil Philistine soldiers, Philistine soldiers. That's active. So many things I'd like to just sit down and talk to you about. So, but my favorite marked moments is when they're very personal even beyond what I need to make it. I remember when God was dealing with me, that's a good young Nazarene boy, just started preaching, had my own business and stuff, but I was preaching and loved it. And I was a youth pastor, and then I'd do whatever else Pastor Art needed me to do. And then all of a sudden, about a couple of years into it, after I, I accepted the call when I was 23, I got saved when I was 21. It was almost 24. I was 23 and eight months old when I was preached my first message, and I'm just 39, so it wasn't that long ago. <clears throat> Amen. And as I think about how, I, that, that was right about when uh, I was uh, around some good brothers, and first time I was exposed to it, my grandma and them were, she was probably Pentecostal and didn't know it, right? We were holiness and all that, and the other part of the family was Baptist, and now some of them's Babdecostal and all the rest of it. But it began to be revealed to me by a friend when I was working for the county, when I, you know, partied out two colleges and totaled three cars, I was working for the county. And we'd always meet at that county garage, which was a big old barn where the trash trucks and stuff parked and the shovels were and the flags were and asphalt stuff. And I remember having to go out and work on a road in tennis shoes because I didn't have boots and stuff. I was living with my mom, but... You know, I just wasn't worth investing in, I guess, at that time. And I'd be freezing with a little jacket on the road out of nowhere, you know, all day long holding a flag. I didn't do that for long. Thank God. God promoted me. But there was a young Church of God guy there, loved God, and he was always talking to me about tongues and Spirit of God. And I'm like, dude, I mean, I'm just trying to be holy. I'm a Nazarene. I love it. I believe in sanctification. I'm fine with what you believe. But, just... but he got an appetite going in me, and I didn't realize it. Then a few years later, a guy that was a comptroller that I reported to to turn billing in and stuff for a couple of businesses I had, uh, he, I didn't know it at the time, real sweet guy, but he's a real powerful guy, and I'd have to meet with him every week and drop my stuff off and report to him on a couple of jobs, and his name was Danny Curry. Well, he was a great Word of Faith pastor in Prestonburg, Kentucky, a church called Rock of Revelation. It's not there anymore. That was years ago. What a name, Rock of Revelation, praise God. That just scared half of Prestonsburg off right there. <laughs> but he had about 100 or so on a Sunday at that time. It didn't grow more, but just a powerful man of the word and faith. And 
really taught me so many things about gifts and power of God. But he would witness to me all the time, and he would just kind of, hey, well, you ever think about, you know, Spirit of God, Acts 2? And I'm like, well, I got to listen to him. The guy writes my checks. So. <laughs> but he just put a seed in me, and I would went away also to college because in the Nazarene denomination at that time, you had to have your bachelor's and all that in ministry. Eventually, your MDiv, which I actually got that Master's of Divinity. You wouldn't know it, but I got it. So anyway, so... Uh, Am I just rambling or is this okay? I'm setting you up for something. So he kept witnessing to me. And finally, I, 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 me and a couple of buddies in the room, they ended up all being preachers. And we were freshmen. I was older freshman at the time because I was more like 25. <clears throat> and these guys, because I'd already started preaching and stuff, and these guys were, you know, 19 or whatever. And we would go in the room and just lock ourselves in and try to pray and see if we'd get the Holy Ghost. We didn't know how to get it. We didn't just pray in our little dorm room. Then finally, I said, this is enough. I went home that weekend. I went to Sunday night service, you know, over there to the Holy Ghost Rock of Revelation Church. And I'm a Nazarene boy and told Pastor Danny I was coming. And I said, yeah, you know, I said, I really want you to meet with you after service. Here I am, poor guy, works a full-time job, preaches Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And this little hair-brained blonde dude with fluffy hair wants to waste his time when he probably wants to go home and eat dinner. But he is nice. He says, no, I'll, I'll do that. And everybody's gone. We're in his little office. And he said, so, so what do you need? Everybody called me Jinger then, right? I said, what do you need, Brother Jinger? I said, I need the baptism of the Holy Ghost or find out if it's real. In two years of this, it's killing me. He's like, well, well, just sit down in the chair there. And he, I, said, I said, I have some questions for you. He said, okay. And I pulled out a yellow legal pad, and I had like three pages of questions down that yellow legal pad. <laughs> Time I got through the second one, he said, can I just pray for you to receive the Holy Ghost? I said, yes, please do. I threw that thing down. And he prayed, and, and, and he said, but I didn't get the manifestation of my tongues, right? But I felt, boom, you know, that power. And... Um, he said, don't worry about that. You're baptized with the Holy Ghost. It'll come. Maybe the nine or so. It'll come. Don't worry about it. It's not the evidence of that will come. But I already discerned the evidence. You're baptized with the Holy Ghost. Sure enough, that night, about midnight, I'm laying there, rolling around. All of a sudden, it just starts rolling out. I get my prayer fingers. It wasn't long after that, <clears throat> God always drew me to healing and miracles, even though, you know, some of the churches didn't practice it. And I remember one night I was laying in bed, still at mom's there, and all of a sudden, you've heard me tell this before, I was asleep. And for me to sleep on my back is unusual. I don't know about you. Unfortunately, I'm a side sleeper. <clears throat> this side, that side, whichever side. But, but I'm laying there, and all of a sudden, I feel and hear the wind of the Holy Spirit from my bottom of my bed. I'm talking about, whew. Now, whew. I'm just laying there. At this time, I knew it was good. I knew it wasn't bad. I knew it had to be the Holy Spirit. I didn't move. A little bit later, second time. By this time, I'm about to burn. I'm just, I'm just like. And then it came a third time, and it was so strong. The anointing of God was so strong. I had to force myself. It's like three men holding me down and break out of the bed and raise up because I was afraid I was going to die. Literally, I felt God so strong. And his manifested presence so strong, it felt if I had any more, it'd been like Moses in the cleft of the rock, God had to show him his hinder parts, right? I just felt like if I had any more, I was just going to explode. I was done. And the Holy Spirit said to me, and God said to me, son, I have marked you. Never forget this anointing. This is your anointing. Never forget your anointing. Always know me and my anointing. So whenever I feel tired or sick, I just take myself back to mom's little bedroom and I just relive that night. When I'm battling something physical, I'm looking for somebody to pray for. Because if I can tap into the revelation I have of God and his anointing, then it will manifest on my behalf. So that was like a marked moment for me. There was other marked moments I could tell you about, but I want to talk to you just a couple minutes about a man who really is where we named our church, Bethel. God gave me this revelation, and his name's Jacob. You know, Jacob, 
Oh, wow, I got to quit. <laughs> Jacob was a deceiver, liar, manipulator, stole his brother's blessing, tried to work out all of his own problems. Even after he got his brother's blessing, he had to run because his brother was going to kill him. He had to go stay with his evil uncle Laban. He had to marry one woman he didn't want to marry, Leah, twice before he could marry his wife he wanted, Rebecca. So he had to work seven years, and he was doing great for Laban and increased his flock. And they deceived him. The tent was dark. He thought it was Rebecca, and it was Leah. So he got a Leah instead of a Rebecca. You know, sometimes that happens in life. You get a Leah instead of a Rebecca. But then you get divorced. You just get another one. So he had to work 14 years to get an opportunity to get Rebecca. Took him 21 years waiting on the promise of Rebecca. We find him now here in Genesis 28. Look at me, just read a few verses, verse 12. It says, Then he dreamed a dream, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and his top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Now, this is the first known time that the, anyone would see the angels coming and going up what we call Jacob's ladder. It was the very first portal where God released his anointing on a location. See, that's why people don't understand tithing. God says, you're robbing me. He said, well, how are we robbing you, Lord? He said, you're robbing me, what? By, by not tithing, right? And by not tithing, I can't open the windows of heaven to pour out a blessing on you. There's not room enough to contain. So it takes part of the defense mechanism God wants to do for you because you become a place called there. You see, Travis said, Pastor, you got up there, kind of things shifted because I'm up there. When I walk in here, I'm assigned to this place. And when I walk in here, I'm there. And when I'm there, whatever God wants to do that he's put through me in my lifetime or whatever he wants to do, he knows I'm crazy enough to try. You are a place called there. You are a place right there where God spoke to you about things he didn't tell your husband, your wife, your friends, your cousins, your brothers, your cats, your dogs, your ministry friends. He's spoken things to you that got you through things that if you didn't have that from God, you wouldn't even be here. And a lot of you have had that talk with God, but you didn't have the revelation. It was God. And I'm going to get into that throughout this series. You are having marked moments a lot in your life that you really don't even recognize. What happens when you don't recognize it doesn't mean it'll ever be revealed to you again. You might, but it's so critical to listen to the Spirit of God so that you can recognize His voice, His Spirit, through the discerning of spirits to operate in whatever it is that the Lord has for you to operate in. And so what our goal is, we don't want to allow anyone to limit our capacity to receive from God. Not a church, not a leader. Now, that doesn't mean we're not submitted and under authority and we're not crazy because you need training. But we should always be open to do and to say whatever God wants us to do it when he wants us to do it and say it. Well, I got a prophecy right now, Pastor. Well, I don't discern that God wants to give a prophecy right now. You hold on to it. He might use it at the end of service or next week. But you bring it up to one of the elders and say, hey, Phil got this word and leave it with him. Because if you have a word, there's probably 15 other people have the same word. They just say it differently. Because it's the same spirit that works all these gifts. And if the gift of prophecy, tongues, interpretation, or prophecy is working, anyone that discerns spirits or, the, or, or operates in the gifts of prophecies or tongues, interpretation, they're picking up on it too. Unless they're angry, mad, offended, upset, and grouchy, they're not. You mean I could be baptized in the Holy Ghost and be grouchy? Yeah, my mom called it ornery, <laughs> among other things. Oh, I stopped there. The angels were ascending and descending, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land which you lie, I will give you and your descendants. 
So when I told you I felt this morning there was generational blessing that God wanted to reveal, you don't even have to get it now. If you get this in your spirit, you can get it today, tonight, this week. You're going to get this revelation of generational blessings from one marked moment. Here he is running from, and then right now this is where he went to Laban. Right now he's just running from Esau, his brother, afraid he'd kill him, going to Laban. But, but now look at this, and he said, not only will I give to you and your descendants, also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and east, north and south. And in you, what's that place called there? In you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God has no limits. He wants every person saved, filled, the Holy Ghost, blessed, healthy, whole. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave until I have done what I have spoken to you. Now, we understand this because in the old co under the old covenant, that dispensation of God, it was before the dispensation of grace, which is Jesus, you remember whenever God, uh, whenever Jesus, whenever he got word that John the Baptist had been uh, had beheaded and he spoke to the 5,000 and their families and he said, there will never be another prophet greater than John the Baptist. He's the greatest prophet of all. But the least of these, children, moms, dads, cousins, aunts, grandmas, grandpas, will be greater than he. 5,000 men and their families, probably 25, 30, 40,000 people there. And they were in a marked moment, but did they hear and hear? They heard it, but did they hear it? They saw it, but did they see it? Some of them, most didn't, but some did over time. Even the disciples didn't get it at that time. They probably thought, oh, Lord, hope we don't get arrested for blasphemy. And he's saying, you know, these people out here who are not even godly, these people out here just wanting to hear a message to get some free food, they're, they're greater than the great John the Baptist. But when God wants to release something, he's released it through a donkey and had him talk to the prophet Balaam and stop and him and the donkey's arguing because Balaam was being paid to go curse Israel. The Bible says he'll make the rocks praise him if he has to. We forget he created all this and we're from dust anyway. I'm just preaching to me and having fun, sorry. No, I'm not sorry. God bless you. Hmm. Hmm. So what did God do? Those marked moments that you have, divine encounters with God, give you some, usually there's a promise attached to it. Part of your destiny. Well, really always some type of promise. And in that, it gives you something to hang on to. Until you get it or until, or when you have it and the enemy's trying to rob you of it. So, Marked moments, as Jacob had, as I share with you myself, many of you have had, all of you probably have had them. They do what? They give me the faith, the anointing, and the grit to hang on to the promises God's spoken of. So anytime I'm tired and don't feel anointed, I say, forget that. I'm, I'm going to have one of my greater anointings ever today because I don't feel good. I don't feel like being here. Matter of fact, I just soon be home grilling on my trailer and fixing me a big 14 ounce New York strip. I'd miss you, but I know I'll see you next week, so it's all good. I think I like getting out driving in the rain and dealing with all the crazy drivers like me out there. I'm like you, except the only thing that separates us is revelation and promises. Well, you know, preacher, you know, five-fold ministry. Yeah, everybody's not necessarily called, you know, everybody's not called to five-fold ministry gift offices, but what about the little girl in the choir in the 40s and 50s, the greatest, 60, I mean, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, Catherine Kuhlman, singing in the choir, a little single girl, singing in the choir in her church. 
And she had a divine moment, had a marked moment with God that changed not only her, but millions of people forever. What was that word? Catherine, you're going to heal my people. She's like singing, talking to God in her head and her heart. What do you mean, God? She's sitting there and the preacher's doing whatever. He said, Catherine, you're going to do miracles, signs and wonders. I'm anointing you. And she said, well, well, well God, wouldn't you use one of these preachers here? I already tried. They didn't hear me. Well, you know, back in those days, it was about men and women. You know, don't allow women in the pulpit and all that demonic stuff. Called it what it is. If you don't like it, I don't really care. You just need to get over your bias and lack of revelation. Other than that, it's all good. She said, well, what about some of these Christian men and these deacons and the elders and men out here? He said, I'll ask them. None of them would do it. What about you, Catherine? She just started weeping. Lord, I can't, but I will if you will use me. Here she's filling arenas for 30 years and one of the greatest anointing women. Just go on YouTube and watch her. Just one of the greatest anointings you'll ever see. What does that tell you, Rick? You know what that tells me? When a marked moment takes place, more than one person can grab the promise. Since God... Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? And there's one Holy Spirit, and it says in the book, is it First or Second Corinthians about the, yes, I forget. I always get it mixed up, chapter 11. And it says they're all distributed by the same Spirit, right? And, and, and in other words, God gives the operation authority, uh, power to do it. He has the power. Jesus has, gives the authority, releases the authority to it, and Holy Spirit operates and fulfills it through people. So in here right now, when I started prophesying or speaking a word of knowledge to this young lady here or the other lady or some of these other people, many of you probably started feeling something stirring you like, man, I, how many of you felt stirring? Like, man, I, I feel like I, gotta, I could add to that, what he's saying to her. Or I feel, like I, I feel like there's more people in this room that needs what he said to her. Why? It's the same spirit. And when God is operating in the prophetic don't judge it, jump in and receive it. When God is operating in the healings and miracles, don't pout at God because you're not getting healed. You probably won't with that attitude. Just pray for those up there getting it and say, Lord, I'm here. Someone else gets their financial breakthrough. No, my oh God, oh, they're not holy. How in the world do they get this? They've been saved two weeks and they got a new car. Give it to them. I'm out doing ministry in this old rattle trap. Hope I get home every Sunday, but no, nobody gave me a car. Well, that person didn't decide to give that young lady a car. God decided to give her a marked moment, and the person got blessed giving her a car because they received a marked moment, and everybody wins except you, the powder. Obviously, it wasn't any of you in here, right? You're too nice for you to be. Mark moments. So whenever the spirit of prophecy operates, grab it. I take that. God prophesied health over somebody. Lord, I received that prophecy. He financial breakthrough. Give it to me, Jesus. You can tap into those things. Well, there's no, God picked that one person out. Well, you need to read the scripture because Paul said, man, at the, at the church of Corinth, they were just everybody prophesying, doing all kinds of stuff, and there was no order in the service. And he said, it'd be better that you, you know, you, uh, what do you speak in English or speak in your language that would 10,000 syllables in, in these tongues. He said, and whenever you're having a prophecy in church, you see there's a public and a private tongue. He's like, let two or three prophesy about it and go on with the matter, not more than two or three. Because there could have been 50 in there had the same word and they all just get up. Because it's not translation, it's interpretation. So when God gives someone a word and they begin to interpret the spirit, they're interpreting it through their history, their windows of what they know. It's like John, John the Revelator. He wasn't going to say, oh, there'll be these nukes flying in these weird helicopters that nobody can see. They're invisible in the sky, blowing up the world. He had to say, I saw these big things like grasshoppers with fire. 
He just could only describe and interpret what God was showing him through what he knew. So learn this. Whenever someone gets up, sometimes you'll hear people and you have that time and two or three people are saying pretty close to the same thing. They just use different descriptions. I'll give you an illustration. When I was at World Harvest, Pastor Rod and on staff, I was like his guy over his local church under him, you know, church growth minister, all the people, all that stuff, except the worship team and the accounting department. Other than that, we run about 12,000 a week, about 3,500 on a Sunday night. And I'll never forget, a bunch of us ministers there on the front, and all of a sudden, somebody jumps up, one of the elders, and gives a tongue. Bah, bro, you know, prophesy in a tongue. I mean, I, people like have to get full. I could give you a tongue and interpretation right now. I could speak a tongue out. That's how I learned to prophesy. I speak in my prayer language so I knew it was a prophetic tongue because a prophetic tongue and interpretation equals a prophecy. I feel it right there right now, but I won't do it because I think you, you, you'll make light of it. You wouldn't, but the one beside you probably would. Anyway, because I never want to mock God. Uh, and it's not, when I say these things, it's not me. It's him teaching and wanting to do just, and I'm not, I mean, no, I'm not saying I'm nothing, but it's not about, all these things. God wants everyone to operate this stuff. So Brother Ted, he's going on to be the Lord. He is a good old retired Assembly of God pastor, a little heavy, kind of jolly fella, you know, curly hair, little professor glasses. He, he liked to preach and stuff. So somebody's up there, pastor lets him give a tongue. Oh, they're giving him a prophetic tongue. They're waiting. Gets quiet for about 10 seconds. Okay. Well, if not, pastor just go and interpret it. I knew I had a word for it. Other, probably a thousand people in a room could have interpreted according to them. Brother Ted Jolly runs up there in his suit and says, has his little glass. I would say, yes, says the Lord. Yes, says the Lord. He says, it's, my spirit is poured out, poured out, poured out all over the sanctuary, poured out like a flood. It's poured out. It, 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 it's as if, you know, because you're going to describe it dramatic. <clears throat> it's as if when you take a fall, untapped keg of beer and when you put that tap down in that keg and open it up it flows and by this time by that 3,000 people are rolling in the floor and he's got his eyes closed he don't know and everybody's real pastor rod's about to fall out of the pew everybody we're all laughing and we didn't mean to laugh at him but it's his description and he's like flow flow and he jumped like this and get about that high because he's heavy he's like, flow and he's running across this big stage he went on for several minutes. We're crying. And he got done. He's like, here you go, Pastor. <laughs> he didn't know what happened. He had his eyes closed. And that's where I learned. Pastor I said, let me teach y'all something. So, and that's where I learned, and then I stated out it's true. He said, even though it wasn't the best illustration he could have used to describe it, <laughs> it still got the point across that the Holy Ghost is overflowing and pouring out in the sanctuary. It just lost your attention. Because when God downloads to you a prophetic interpretation, you're to interpret through who you are and what you know. It's not a translation. You're not translating what God said. You're just sharing and releasing an interpretation of it. Wow, I'm all over the place today. God bless you. So God gave Jacob these promises, and he has other divine moment encounters, even days with God. But he gave it to him to, to hang on to. So when the promise was attacked, when the promise is attacked, the callings attacked, the families attacked, because his had to do with generations. <clears throat> He's ex exiled from his homeland, running from his life and all that. And we see <clears throat> that after God spoke to Jacob in his dream, he, he was a different man at that point. He hadn't totally changed, but it was a great start. And in Genesis 32, it says, we read the story, <clears throat> one marked moment encounter that marked Jacob for the rest of his life, along with all his family descendants for generations. In this one account, encounter, li literally a nation, and the world was hanging in balance on that one word that God gave that one young man running for his life who was a liar and a deceiver. 
Next week, I'll start with four ways to know how you're, you're ready for a marked moment encounter with God. I'm going to stop. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Just close your eyes and ask. You can whisper it or say it or just in your heart. Lord, did I miss anything today I needed to get? Did I miss anything, any truth, any thought, any example that I need to hang on to? So to help me hang on to the things you've spoken over my life or will speak in the future. See, we talk a lot about learning and teaching and stuff. But you can teach and you can learn a lot of stuff, but it's what's revealed from God is the main thing. God, is there anything I didn't hear or see that I needed to hear or see? Is there anything I need to have a greater understanding of? And then once he downloads that to you, we'll pray here in a minute, but once he does, then you need to put that in your phone or jot it down so that when you're in your time with God, he'll start revealing scriptures to you. He'll start revealing things to you about that. I remember years ago when we first introduced Divine Encounters, part of our mission, is the main mission statement for that year, I don't know, 2010 or something, I don't know, way back there. Miss Gwen and all, well, most all of you here remember it. And man, the first three months a year, I was just having divine encounters. Man, God just dropping stuff in me, wake me up, do all this stuff. Then all of a sudden, man, several weeks went by, and other people in the church gave me testimonies about these divine encounters with God, these marked moments. And I'm like, Lord, you haven't spoke to me in two weeks, three weeks, what's up? I'm pouting at him, go to bed. All of a sudden, Holy Ghost wakes me up, middle of the night, upstairs, bed was set, wakes me up. And, uh, look over at the clock. It's like one of those back we had the clocks, the digital numbers, you know. And I looked at the clock. I can't remember now if it had 33.3 on it already or whatever. I go downstairs. I mean, it's early hours in the morning. I had a bunch of meetings the next day, and I'm like, Lord, I'm pretty sure this is you. I sit on the couch within three minutes. Whoa! It's almost like it was real close to the anointing I felt that night in my room. I couldn't even speak. I just sat there and bawled for at least an hour. Just bawled. Just bawled. Felt so refreshed. And I haven't had a lot of those in my life, maybe 20 or 30 in my life, and I've been doing this for 40 years, close to 40 years. I'll never forget. I was okay, Lord, you're going to have to speed up time because oh, i got a stack day tomorrow. And the Lord said, look at the clock. Look at the clock. I said, what? It's 30, it's 3.33 in the morning. He said, yeah, go to Jeremiah 33.3. Somebody got that real quick? You can give it to me. Man, every version's great. This is what he spoke to me when I, I didn't even go to bed. I just went right back and I said, I got to look this up in the Word. You can reach it to me whenever. I guess I could have put it on the screen. Being easier, but there's all the version it says, Call on me in prayer, and I will answer you. I will show you great and mysterious things you still do not know about. What's another one? There's some great ones. Another translation. Okay. Call unto me, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Give me another translation of that. Ask me and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. I just started reading all the translations because I wanted to get all of it. So if you don't get anything else today, start praying over Jeremiah 33.3. Whenever you need an answer, it says, call on me. What's the good old New King James say? That's good too. Give me New King James. What's it say? Call, call to me, and I will answer you. And show you great and mighty things you do not know. Call on him. How you do it? Help, please. 
Eventually, you'll get in faith. Just keep wallowing. Just waller enough, get low enough, you'll start getting some faith. But prayer is simply communing and conversing with, asking, receiving from God. Being in communion and covenant with, communing with, communing and conversing, having conversation. That means you're not just talking to God, you're also listening. And then it's important about asking. We all got that done. Lord, I need a car, I need new tires, or I need healed, whatever. But people are so far, so concerned on the asking, they forget the receiving. So you can do all the first three steps and miss the fourth one and not get what you're believing for. Because it's communing, conversing with, asking and receiving from God. He's the giver of all things. So this week, just pray Jeremiah 33, 3 over your life, over your health, over your family, over your finances, businesses, whatever it is you're praying for.